everybody. Um, thank you for being here. We're already in open session because we started the, the evening and closed session. Um, and I will call this portion of the meeting to order. We do roll call. Here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Here, Here. 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 Okay. Next, we have recognition of public comments. Uh, this is the time when visitors may request to address the Board of Education on uh, any item germane to the role and function of the Board of Education. Uh, when I so direct, uh, if you please take the podium, uh, state your name, and make your statements. You have five minutes for the presentation. And we have one person who'd like to speak, uh, Mr. Patrick Sherman. Patrick Sherman. Um, I have four kids at the high school, one at King. We have a problem at the high school with my Two, three bikes a day, easily, is what I'm hearing every day from my kids. I have one daughter who broke up with a boy nine months ago. Now, this boy wanted his to break her back from nine months ago. So he sends a group of six girls after her. One of them gets a hold of her. She defends herself with my girl. I held her accountable at home, critically in herself. I hold her phone for five days. All right? She gets threats all week from those same girls. I address it with Mr. Harden Monday morning when she's due back because they were going to jump her again. He sends her home for two days, excused, so we can let the situation calm down. He's going to pull those girls into the classroom or into the office and talk to them. I take her back that Wednesday. Mr. Harden's not there. She's not in the building for 20 minutes. And those girls come up behind her, and she runs from them to the office. They're already trying to get her. He said he has the situation handled. Now, Miss Dorch says that she's going to walk her from class to class, personally, to keep her from getting attacked again, and then to the bus after day. She didn't show up the last two classes. The moment she stepped out of band, those girls attacked her. Ten shots to the head. Right beside one of the teachers. Nobody could do nothing. Who are we gonna hold accountable? I'm hearing from the principal. Well, it's a it's a situation nationwide. I don't care about the nation. I care about what we have in our district. I don't care if we stop every construction project and hire 10 more security guards at the school. I don't care if the teachers have to leave the classroom early and go stand out there and make sure these kids are being protected. We got kids getting jumped walking between the gravity doors back to the high school. They're being I have got a kid that's a yell stop. He's being told whenever he tells the teacher that he's being messed with, that if he says anything, they're going to get him when he's on his way back to the school. Now, that's a zero tolerance for him. Why isn't there zero tolerance for everybody else? Mr. Harden tells me, oh, we got uh, no child left behind for my hand to tie. And I called my quote, I said, I call BS on that. I was in school for no child left behind. Mr. Wolfman let it go. He said, well, now my hands are tied with sin at 101. I read Senate 101, I couldn't find anything about that. These kids don't care about that $75 ticket that you're giving them, their parents are going to pay. It's not hurting them, it's hurting their parents, pocketing their parents, don't care. When do we start holding the kids accountable? When do we start holding the administration accountable? Because right now the school's not safe. Teachers can't do nothing to stop the fights. Teachers put their hands on them, pull them off. Then they're going to be fired. We're supposed to talk about COVID spread for me. What was that? <laughs> I'm just, I, I've got a kid right now. She hasn't been in school in three weeks. Terrified. We're trying to get her into the, what they call the SSS program. We can't even get a call back from that. 
Had to call the school three times a day to find out that that teacher was out till the end of the week and that we might get a call tomorrow from somebody else. Now, she's taken this entire quarter. This quarter is gone for her. There's no grade. I mean, there's, there's nothing left for that. We're hoping we can get her into this program, but where's the safety there? She's still got to ride the bus home because I've still got to work. Are they going to assure that she's going to be safe getting to the bus? I, I'm just, we're at a loss of words. I don't know what we can do about the violence. I know, I've heard it from three different teachers that there was a situation at Churchill right before Christmas that a kid was standing there screaming at a teacher in the hallway saying, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? It was a female teacher and the boy had her oversized. Two teachers had to run out there, male teachers, and try not to touch him and escort him down to the school or down to the office. The kid was sent home that day to cool off and got to come back the next day after he was verbally threatening a teacher. Who are we going to hold accountable? I know it's on the parents. It starts at home. But the only time I ever see anything from anybody is when Mr. Asplund's making a YouTube video and handing out pizza at the school because of a TikTok trip. When are you guys at the school shaking hands, sitting down with these kids, talking to them, seeing what we can do? Because it's getting old. I don't know what we're supposed to do. Okay, next on the agenda is presentations to the board. Um, we have a board goals presentation from King School. student has their learning confirmed and that process is repeated. 
Um, the rest of the students, they have downtime. Downtime can create unwanted or disruptive student behaviors because those students are not engaged and they are not on the hook for their learning. Um, what cooperative learning does is it puts what's called a structure into place to make sure that all students have someone to share with, uh, either a peer or a teacher, and make sure that 100% of the students get to share and that they get to share simultaneously. So there are several structures that we use at King School this year. Um, I'm just gonna share three of those. One structure is called Stand Up, Hand Up, Pair Up. So for example, going back to the traditional instructional strategy of one student raises their hand, one student answers. In a class of let's say 20 students, that means 5% of the students are engaged with that question. And then it goes on to a different question. With Stand Up, Hand Up, Pair Up, students find their own partner and in that partnership, they take turns sharing. We call this um, the snapshot level. So if Mrs. Hawkins would come in and take a snapshot of the structure stand up, hand up, pair up, she would look at that picture later. She would see that 50% of the students are actively engaged in that moment with that question. However, the total engagement is 100% because both partners do get to share and answer that question. So both students are engaged, all, I'm sorry, all students are engaged, they're all on the hook for their learning, they're all at, um, actively listening and working on those social skills as well. Another structure that we use is quiz, quiz, trade. Quiz, quiz, trade, instead of the teacher posing the question, now students have cards, and they will each quiz each other on what's on the card, whether it's math, reading, it can be used in any content area, and they share, and if they have the right answer, that's, they get praise. If they don't, they have someone there to coach them to get that right answer, and that's the, also that social skill. 100% engagement during the structure at any given moment. Another structure that's mostly used for fun right now is called talking chips. On the chips that you can see in the picture, there's a question on every chip, and this really practices patience and turn taking because cho students choose their chip, what question they want to answer, and only the student touching the chip can answer. The rest are actively listening and practicing that patience. And 25% of students at any given moment are engaged with the structure. So Mrs. Bayerman is going to talk about structure for small groups. Okay. So, um, one of the challenges that we have um, this year with um, starting this cooperative learning uh, when we have small groups that are working in the classroom is like I have my kids that are in a group of three to eight at my little table, but we're housed within the larger classroom. So there are other groups of kids working. Some are working independently. Some are working in other groups. There might even be a whole class session going on off to the side and just my group is with me. So we have some structures that work in those situations. So at my table, I can do one called the round table, which is actually, um, that's my students' favorite one. They really like it when we do round tables. Um, it works for targeted small groups because the kids are engaged. Um, it's a shared activity, which makes it lower pressure for students. And the kids are checking and coaching one another. Um, it's easy to implement in a small group within the classroom without disrupting other groups. And basically the way it works is um, I can either, like we start with a word or a sentence or a math problem. The first person does the very first step or first letter or first word of whatever we're doing. Then they pass it to the next person. Each person, when they get it, they have to check the previous work and then pass it on. So there's a lot of... Um, good conversation that happens as the group is passing that work around. Um, another one that um, is a favorite in some of our specials classrooms is called Fan and Pick. Um, it comes off of these map management maps that we have at King School that helps with the organization of our cooperative learning structures. Um, for Fan and Pick, you fan the cards out, pick a card, the next person answers, and the last person responds. So in the group of four, it works because each student has a role. Um, every child has a responsibility. And after each um, round, the responsibilities rotate so everybody gets a different turn of a different job. 
Um, and that one also can work in small groups because you don't have to disrupt the rest of the classroom. And then another one that we use a lot as interventionists in small groups is round robin. Round robin is really similar to um, the first one that we were talking about, only for round robin, it's an oral component. So we're not writing words or math problems, we're sharing some answers out loud. So maybe they each work their own math problem. And then you go around the circle and each student has a chance to share what answer they got and then have a conversation about um, why you got what you got or why you got different answers. Again, that's another great structure um, for targeted small groups because you can engage in that conversation in a small group without interrupting the rest of the classroom and what the classroom teacher is doing. So the way to make sure that we're implementing these with fidelity and making sure the staff feel comfortable and confident to be able to use these is all of our monthly staff meetings are based solely at the start on professional development of these cooperative learning structures. So we structured our monthly staff meetings so the teachers receive an asynchronous slide that's the day before that kind of has your information dumped so that we can spend our monthly staff meetings practicing the structures. And the way we practice the structures is we have the teachers as the students. So we engage them in the structure as part of our staff meeting. So if there's a structure of the month that we're going to learn, we introduce it to the teachers, they engage in it. We have to leave mine at the very end so people or any questions that staff have on that important uh, information. Uh, Mrs. Armstrong and I are also available to go in and coach within the classroom. So teachers can sign up and ask Mrs. Armstrong to sign up in several classrooms to do the structures alongside of the teacher and model the structures and then just come in and, and provide feedback to these teachers as they're doing the structures. How can we tweak it? How can we not? Um, in the middle picture, we actually asked the staff during December which structures do they feel comfortable with. We introduced six for them, set goals for them. And so they came and did a rating of which ones they felt comfortable with. So that then Mrs. Armstrong and I were kind of able to plan what are they comfortable with, what are they making more coaching on, and are we ready to add more structures uh, to their knowledge base. This is an example of Dropbox and meetings with students. We used to during our SIP team meetings so that committee could work together as part of the system of the whole. And then they broke out and put their Dropbox on our progress towards goals and different activities that we needed to be adding in the layer in, and then we brought it back to the committee as a whole to work on. But really, we wanted you to hear it from the students what they thought about cooperative learning groups. So I hope the volume is okay and you're giving a couple extra minutes. If it's not loud enough, please let me know. Any 
It doesn't look like it. Okay. <coughs> Here in October, the Illinois Music Education Association holds auditions at JSCO High School. Um, the state's divided into nine districts. Uh, GHS is in District 2. We had six students that made the ILMEA district bands. Uh, from there, they determine uh, the best students in each district to create Allstate. And uh, we're very proud to have four students this year today to Allstate. These students will be participating. Uh, from January 27th to January 29th, Murray Civic Center. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our students to you. Uh, when I call your name, just come on up and uh, accept your certificate. Um, our first student is Briar Townsend. This is Briar's third year as a clarinet player in all states. Our next student is a uh, senior. Uh, jazz pianist, and this is Luther Gomez. Uh, up next, we have a uh, junior uh, tenor saxophonist and Brady Warner. And then our 
our final student uh, couldn't be here with us this evening. This is her second year in uh, Allstate, and that's Sophie Edwards on violin. We're very proud of our students, and uh, we can't wait to see them play in here. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to everybody, and uh, likewise, the board. We're also very proud of the work you've accomplished. Moving on, uh, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Any questions or comments? Allison? Yes. Aye. 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 Next on the agenda is the Gilbert High School Student Council Report. Um, our student council took some time off for the holidays, but we are going to be having our first meeting back tomorrow to discuss some of our plans for the next few months. Um, we finally finalized our school t-shirt design, as well as the dates for some of the various activities for school week. Um, just as a reminder, I know that I talked about it last month, um, but our school week spirit days are going to be PJ day for the Monday, anything but a backpack day for Tuesday, meme slash bond slash TikTok day for Wednesday, white lie t-shirt day for Thursday, and spirit day of course for Friday. Um, in the past we've had the four classes create class walls for school spirit week, um, but this year we're going to um, propose to have each class in our class windows for um, spirit week instead. Um, they will need to be completed by Friday, February 4th, because we'd like to have them on display for some of our various school um, sports that we're going to have that week. Um, speaking of sports, the Swirl Slam, which is our boys volleyball event during that week, will occur on February 7th at 7 p.m., so consider coming out to support the school. Um, practices for this event will happen on the 3rd and we will also be having another blood drive on Friday, February the 4th from 1 um, through 6 p.m. in the GHS Commons like last time. There is a blood shortage happening right now, and so we would love to see some of your boys like to go to save a life and also get a free t-shirt. That doesn't, doesn't hurt at all. Um, at the last blood drive, we collected a total of 32 units of blood, which will save up to 96 lives, and we had 25 new donors, which is great. Um, we will have sign-ups going on during lunch from January 24th through the 28th, and January 31st through February 4th for students. Um, the finalist role will take place on the 12th of February after all of our weekend activities. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, back to another with student council. Um, next on the agenda is the curriculum report. Uh, Dr. Sparks. We have my report is presented to the questions. Does anybody have any questions? No? Well, thank you so much. Very good, thank you. And uh, special ed report. I don't have anything additional to add to my report other than next month I plan on doing a presentation on our STEM program and hopefully we'll have some more information about how the new coffee shop is going. Yeah, I have a question about that. I would buy the high school <laughs> to look at the construction. I couldn't buy a cup of coffee. Oh my God. How do I do it? <laughs> I, I'll find that out. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what time it is. They're not open all day long. Well, you let us know. I will. Okay, you let us know the hours, please. I will. Well, thank you. And um, next is the building reports. Anybody have any questions concerning those? We have some principal, sir. Okay. Yep. Well, looks like a lot going on in the different buildings, so I appreciate all the principals writing up the, the building reports. Um, while we're moving on real quick, uh, next, uh, building and grounds committee report. And, uh, that would be Rodney? No, no, no photos this time. No photos. But we have an update. Yes. So, the building um, at the high school has come along really nice, and I got really nervous uh, back when we had the wind, one of the first... <laughs> wind events and took the walls, the west walls out of the 
the new choir and band edition kind of made me nervous. And we were told it set us back three weeks, but between Russell and Liggett, I got a kudos to those people. We only lost three days. And so now if you drive down Fremont, you can see progressing really nicely. And, and uh, that just gets you excited to what's, what you see there. And then you get inside uh, the high school project is there's no area of the high school that won't be touched. And so then uh, later in the agenda, we're going to go over some things that we're going to do in, in the summer of 22 to finish off the, the high school project and or other, other schools. So no pictures tonight, but rest assured all the lockers are now in and lockers is one of my pet peeves. Um, going clear back a year ago so all the lockers are in um, everything's coming along really nicely um, I think all the major skeletons that we may have encountered have been tackled and put to bed so everyone listening the the project is going really well and progressing nicely and I, I don't know any timelines that we're way off now um, everything coming together not too long ago, Russell Construction gave us uh, a list of timelines for the different specific aspects of uh, uh, the construction project. Or is everything, you know, in line with that? The next month, that right now, and we'll we'll come next month uh, looking at those dates and give an update on if anything is off track. But right now, everything seems to be tracking pretty much on. Um, Kudos once again to Russell and Leggett of, you know, if there's a change, they keep us informed and they've been doing a really good job of making it happen. And they, they understand that our push is to start the new school year next year with, with everything done. Barring no disasters, COVID, supply, whatever, we should, notice I said should, um, start next school year with everything complete. And we will. I, I did not say we will. More, Maury Lyon did. <laughs> I do notice every time I go to the high school, it seems like there's something else that's been completed. Uh, I, I noticed the lights and the, the comments, the, the chandelier lights have been installed. Um, the coffee shop area is. Oh, well, that's completely completed. Yes, it is. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, there's, like I said, every time I go there, I believe even the flooring on the, the north section, I saw some of the third installing that. I guess it'll still be in the. Right, that was really good. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen that yet, so. Okay. That was Tiana's idea to put that there. Thank you, Tiana. Anybody have any additional questions concerning the building and grounds committee report? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, moving on, need a consider approval of bid specs for Bright Futures, the 940 Fremont renovations. So moved. Second. Okay. So you, you received the bid specifications for those uh, projects, which is all in one building. Uh, maybe we can go. Uh, nothing's really changed from any of the presentations that you've uh, been given over the last few months. Uh, Brian Archibald is on uh, on the computer. If anybody has any specific questions about any of the of the bid specs, then uh, Lee Marbach is also on there as well. Uh, I want to just go over the timeline again really quickly about when we would be uh, letting out bids for this particular project. And, the staging of that. Yeah. Try to talk now. Yeah. You're on mute. Are you there, Lee? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. This is Brian. Uh, we are, for Bright Futures, we're scheduled to go out to bid at the end of this month. And we are bidding throughout uh, the end of this month into February, and we'd be looking to bring the final bid uh, contracts to the board at the March board meeting. 
Um, as far as construction goes, construction uh, demolition will probably start soon after April, May. Uh, the indoor play area is scheduled, uh, needs to be done this summer before uh, the beginning of July. And then the outdoor play area also is on that same schedule. So there's some contract work that needs to get done. I think we have scheduled um, June 1st or June 4th uh, for it to be completed for separate contractors to come in to complete that work. But the, in most of the interior, we're not looking to occupy until August of 23, correct? Yes, that is the discussion we've been having to, to give some time um, and not to share contractors between between projects. I think Lee may be trying to talk. There, there was discussion on trying to finish the schedule and possibly have half the building occupied in December. Um, that, that construction schedule is still being adjusted. I hope I got that right, Lee. Yeah, is that can you hear me now? I'm trying to there you go. There you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no, you're you're right on. Uh, so kind of high level. Um, I think Brian kind of went a little deeper dive, but yeah, we're looking at a spring um, completion of Bright Futures, not a lot of time for uh, furniture and everything to kind of align with what Maria said. So um, if we're able to accelerate part of that, get some of it occupied sooner than we but we all know the reality we do live in with lead time. So, and then with the power shortage with the high school, but it's 712 campus being a uh, priority over the summer. So kind of a big picture and I'll jump together, kind of morphies together. So the 2022 improvements, which is the next line, that's really a March to July project. And then Bright Futures overlaps that kind of started in April. Uh, to Brian's point, getting some areas done that have to be done this summer and then going into that February uh, time frame. So that's kind of what we're looking at for these two projects. And how that interplays with the, the current project, um, Rodney kind of mentioned that we're on track for Area A to be finishing up this uh, this spring. Uh, we're looking at about May. And then uh, Auditorium Area U, we're looking at June. So we're right on schedule for all those items and then now flow right in and play through improvements. That include the site work and interiors. So. Does anybody have any questions concerning the bright about the bright features? We own that building, right? Are they still renting us? The rent goes through the end of this month. Okay. okay. Oh, the sign on the, the front, yes. And then I also actually spoke to um, Galesburg sign about the empty sign that sits there on Fremont. Um, the old Bell Scott sign. Right. Yes. So actually, um, Ken recommended that we actually cut that sign down because it's so large. He said we really didn't need anything that large, which was our concern about putting something back up there. So we're going to be working on a design that incorporates um, JVC and Bright Futures and then any administrative offices that would be in that building. So hopefully by spring we'll have that as well. Okay. Well, uh, personal comments. So looking at the design of the building, I'm excited to see it. It's uh, it is really neat work on it. And, uh, Playground area and the, the, the classrooms. It's pretty exciting to look forward to it. Um, Allison? Hi. 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 Yes. Well, that was easy. Uh, moving on, uh, consider, you know, motion to consider approval of the bid specs. For summer 2022 improvements at King, Steel, Lombard, and the 712 campus. So moved. Second. I'll turn it over to Mrs. Sam here in a second. But uh, last month we had an extensive conversation about uh, everything on this list. We, we cooled the list down. 
Uh, you see the list in front of you. We tried to break it down kind of by area. Um, and uh, as I said, I will turn it over to Mrs. Ham, but the budget numbers are still the same. Uh, financial assumptions are still the same. And Mrs. Ham, if you'd like to give a high level overview of what that project is. Um, I have, as Dr. Hoskins said, divided this up depending on kind of the area of the summer 2022 work. Um, Bright Futures, which we just previously discussed, we're still at an estimated budget of 7.1. For the 712 Building and Ground Summer 2022 work, we're looking at 2.2 million. That would include um, everything um, that we are looking to upgrade with NGHS, um, as well as the parking structures for staff and faculty, the runway parking, um, upgrading all of that. That includes the 712. Um, JHS, former JHS work. Then we have the 712 athletic facilities, and that's $992,750. That includes quite a bit of work in Whitehall, um, which definitely needs some upgrade and some attention, including a new sports floor, um, bleachers, so that we can hold junior high and high school events in there. Um, What's the map in place now? Map. So there are maps oh, on the wall. On the wall. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, no, it's a different, it's a sports floor. It's a rolling sports floor. It's a little bit yeah. higher quality than what's in there. Um, and then also included in this um, are bleachers for the field house and then the track resurfacing, which we talked about quite a bit last month, but is in dire need of um, upgrade and repair. Then we move to the steel facilities work. Uh, the casework is really the bulk of this $565,000. Uh, it is the casework in the original part of the building that was not replaced in 2011 when steel was uh, renovated. Um, we are also looking to make all of our facilities equitable, so we do not have any windows in our band and choir room. It's a very kind of dark area, so we're adding three windows doing some um, remediation of some water damage that are in the walls and some lamination. So that- Did you find out what was causing that damage to the wall? They're still, no, they're still gonna, when they tear it to everything, they'll hopefully be able to identify the cause of that. So in terms of equity, how is it came recently? They don't use it as a, a drop ceiling or anything, right? It's sharp. Have we considered that at steel at any point? But it wasn't interested in or is it going to be the air conditioning making it impossible? I don't know, it's just, it's the king looks nice. It has that ceiling in it, right? Yeah. Right. I, I don't know. Uh, Something we should have put there. Sorry, the air conditioning might be an issue, but yeah, I don't know. We can take a look at that. We can ask Russell. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it makes the acoustics worse than that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay, just a moment. Um, then we're moving on to King. Um, as part of our SR3 money, we're building sensory paths at Steel and at King School, as well as Lombard. So we're looking at a $20,000 project there. We have some work that we need to do at the Hawthorne Center, which is where we basically house all of our maintenance staff and materials, supplies, equipment, um, as well as our district inventory. We have never had a district inventory shelving system. We've never had a formal inventory system, which we've been working on this year, put into place. So this is kind of the next step um, that we need to invest in for the Hawthorne Center. And that's 375,000, and that includes the roofing repairs. And then we have district-wide landscaping, which also is part of the courtyard projects that um, include the sensory paths but there's quite a bit of area around GHS that needs to be re-landscaped after the um, additions and renovations are complete, as well as the courtyards from Steel and King that were never completed as part of construction as we determined what we were going to use that space for. So we have a total of $11,484,450, and you can see how this is distributed across each of the fund balances. Any questions? I just have a comment. Um, we we met with with Leggett and uh, 
for about two and a half hours the other day going over all these plans. And I'll have to say, you, you, you hear that figure and you say, oh boy, that's a, that's a lot of money. And it is. I am not downplaying that. But I can tell you uh, the White Hall gym and that facility, for instance, is in dire need of repair and upgrading and that. So a lot of thought and a lot of things are going in, into the White Hall, especially when we're going to a 712 campus. Um, some things to finish off the high school. Um, when you're bringing the, the seven, eight in there, the wood shop and those things. Uh, parking. Um, parking's a big issue. So we're adding a uh, parking on the northeast side of the 712 campus. Uh, the runway. Um, so there's a lot of things that have to be done to finish a project. And so this is what's going on here. And then all the, I've been to all the schools and the courtyards are in dire need of, of a facelift, uh, make them look presentable. And that's what we're doing here. And, and the, the Liggett, I'll give a lot of credit. We're not just doing landscaping in the courtyards are also very functional and they're very te a, a, a teaching environment also. Same way at the high school in the courtyard, it's gonna be very functional and usable and, and space that everybody can see is, is a nice improvement to, to our school. So we get, we're just not gonna have a building, we're gonna have a, a drive up to a facility that's very presentable and very, very functional. And this is Jana. Go ahead, Jana. Really quickly, I cannot find last month's um, spreadsheet. What items are not included on this spreadsheet that you had originally brought to us? The only things that are not included are we have looked at paying off the remainder of the JVC loan, and then JVC would be repaying back the district. We removed that because it really wasn't summer work. It was just um, confusing. And then we were also looking at potentially purchasing $2 million in debt of another school district's debt um, to basically increase our, our revenues and our investments. So right now our investments are really earning nothing. So we could earn slightly more through purchasing debt of another school that was on there. So that was about $3.8 million that was on last month that is removed from here because it was confusing that we're talking about work and then talking about other debt structures. So that's, those are the only two items that are removed. Well, there, I don't think there was no budget items. We also talked about some work at Field Gym and we decided not to pursue this summer. That was never, we would already removed that. Right, okay. So I know we discussed it, so I want to yeah. make sure. That, yeah. Okay. And then the, the specs for this too as well, even then I think it's the same for keeping it on there, but the Hawthorne grew up in the shelving is not part of this. So it's just specs for the yeah. piece of it. So. Yeah. It's on the budget because it's still money we're talking about doing, but in terms of what the specs were to let out bids, it's not. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I, I got a couple. Um, with the, the new lots, are those concrete lots or asphalt? <coughs> Could be your. They go up to do it. Depends on the they'll be an alternate. Okay. Um, I was also uh, wondering about lighting on those new lots because it does get kind of dark back in those areas. Yeah, I believe, Brian or Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, there'll be two additional light. Uh, lights for the expanded parking lot down there at the, in between the high school and White Hall, correct? Correct. We added those on Thursday. Those weren't part of the bid documents, but they will be for our out bid documents. We also added a sidewalk. So there wasn't a sidewalk from that new northeast lot to the, what would have been the GHS North door into it. So we added a sidewalk in there also. We also added a sidewalk from that would go from the new parking lot uh, by the old boiler room and go in so you can get in then to the hooks up with the sidewalk the big sidewalk that goes north and south uh, by the 
the gym, the, uh, the east doors of the gym, that sidewalk. We also added in there that sidewalk, that big white sidewalk that goes along the east side is in dire need of repair. So we'll re get that fixed when placed. Um, and then lighting was brought up so we did add lighting out there. Okay. Another concern I had is on the, the northeast lot. Um, the staff lot. I guess that'd be staff lot. Yes. Oh, yes. Look at where we got the new, new construction addition to the north side of uh, the 712 complex. Are well, you talking about the parking on the street? I'm thinking it'd be built in the, the parking lot between Whitehall and, and the 712. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, I'm a little concerned. Do we have a, um, vehicle crash barriers between the parking lot and the building? We, we, we have an applied for driving. A 10-foot uh, crash barrier outside the building before the driveway begins. Correct. But, but that 10-foot uh, crash area is a good stop at the airport. We will have parking uh, parking concrete stops there too. Okay. We, we can add more than that if you would like, but um, we did put in, as Maury said, the landscape buffer of 10 feet um, plus the parking stop so no one rolls in it. Uh, anything, anything more speed than that, you would have to add um, a larger barrier, pipe bollards, or um, something of that sort if, if that is a concern. No, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. That's your expertise, but I just want to make sure that we don't have a vehicle inadvertently roll into the classroom because the park is kind of close. There's actually more of a barrier than there used to be. Okay. Um, so prior to construction, people would really pull up and right. bumpers would almost be touching the right. side of the, the building at times. So now we have a nice landscape buffer plus the parking um, stops that will create that, that kind of natural, I guess, visual. Well, will that be a, a flat grassy area or is that a more of a burn or it'll it'll be burned with dirt and mulch and then filled with uh grasses and i think we actually have a full tree back there yeah. 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 it would look a lot better at this point right? oh no no doubt um i was also just curious you know we have an awful lot of parking lots now with that addition do you have any idea how many parking spots we'll have right was it is it 240? Am I? We added another 150. Well, we're adding another 57 spots with that addition. There you go. Yep. It, it's close to, I, I thought it was over, it's over 100. I thought it was like 115, not counting the runway. Does that include the, um, the parking along the um, addition of A and B? Yes. And I could go back and count and give you an actual number. I, I thought it was around 115, 120, not counting any of the parking on the runway. Yeah, and just to clarify too, um, that we are just doing concrete. We're not doing an alternate for asphalt this time. Um, we found that, you know, down in that market, asphalt tends not to be, concrete is very competitive to asphalt and you don't have many sources for asphalt so we get better numbers in that area for equivalent numbers for concrete so all the other bids we've done in the past two years have wanted up concrete we did that alternate so we decided just to stick with the concrete and the design on this one that's good news yeah. and also as member phelps had mentioned as far as the courtyards yeah, that definitely is something i look forward to seeing that being done and I definitely want to see that as a usable you know, teaching environment, not just a, a landscape uh, pretty area. Also, um, we the West Drive that goes into the Circle Drive, that's going to be redone. But I also had them add another speed bump in there because I witnessed when they come around that uh, West Circle, they can get a pretty good head of steam up coming so we've added another speed bump but we made them removable for winter so that we could get snow removal through there also because that's going to be a main artery coming in and out of the, behind the high school so be looking for that too is that the field circle 
Less circle drive. Circle drive. Less 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 circle drive.
very slightly. Uh, so I think they are about there still right now. I think they're doing good. Uh, students, first two, correct. Students with the best and talent for the staff. Um, so potentially that could be shift a little bit, but it usually comes about time down. Um, we tend to try and go for about four weeks, and so they kind of custom trying to kind of go for it. Uh, so it's probably, um, if we were having traffic, they can't have that one. Mr. Spindler, have you spoken? As you've spoken to the travel groups, um, obviously there's a lot of concern at this table about COVID, which I know you share, but um, and especially in light of the fact that Germany is arguably stricter than we are. Uh, explain to everybody here that will be voting on this, you know, what are the protections in place for our, other than the monetary protections here? Uh, things such as what if somebody got stuck over there? Um, what if somebody got sick over there? How, how would you address those concerns? Sure. Um, so in terms of the travel, we're looking to vaccinate it. Um, not entirely to restrict it more than just in cases, but because we will be fully vaccinated to do that, to get the better there. Um, that would potentially then require for a flight to Germany without things. Um, in the event uh, that the does come down so that that is now covered with our travel insurance to some degree, whereas two years ago when they were looking, you know, that was not covered, right? The travel insurance covers everything but pandemic usually in the life of that. Wonderful. Um, but so it is now covered within that aspect. Um, the quarantine should we have to have one because if somebody come down quarantine would um, occur um, in the host family home for the plan. So that should be um, it, at the end and require some stay. That's part of why we are taking the chef on to the intention that one be able to stay after and go and fly back with uh, the students who are calling that. Obviously, we have a second chef on the event that can be part of you know, as far as COVID, so that group can start on time without um, delays and response and stuff like that. So, that is the, those are, I think, the major sensitive. Um, we will have to bring our vaccine card to this, um, that's required for entry to various things, um, fairly commonly to ask for some other things. Um, I'm still trying to get out the um, structure of how far we go, I think it will take more within Germany itself than it usually is on the case on these. Often we like to take those trips. Um, sometimes you know, another one just a lot of delay for the like that. Um, but with the uncertainty of increased COVID restrictions for entry and things like that, um, and with the, you know, the security of being a little bit closer to home, we're probably going to take most of the non-building. We're still considering slight bit. Mr. Spiller, who applies through the Ministry of Health for all of our students and staff that are going over? I only know this because our family was supposed to go to Germany this summer, mm -hmm. and just because of the complexity of everything. As far as um, as far as the, the COVID entry, they're filling out the online form for. And the for, certification, yeah. For arrival, that's probably me. Like, okay. usually I would do that. But like, when I have to do um, plane tickets um, on both sides, when we're doing up the census, the, um, the um, customs data for both directions usually, um, that's also primarily to for us to kind of fill that out of the students getting their forms and then, you know, the, the customs declarations, pre declarations that we're going to make these kind and family. And then the testing, because now there's the 24 hour return testing. Right. So, yes, that I encountered that a lot more from the US side, and I think it's pretty similar. Um, the plan is that we will find a facility building that will do that. Um, so, we have a sufficient amount of time to cover more of that. We've got that in the place, and we can line them up, and I'll talk with my partners over there so that we can make sure that you're um, good to go and have that one to go so that we'll be able to get our test back. Is that something that students have to pay for on top of? No, no, because it's a little cost of living there. And do students pay for this themselves? They do. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm um, not freezing current costs, but the, the trip is coming in hundred, which is even a little lower than some of the in the past. Um, we might be a little less traveling than normally, but um, we can still get some of the The plane ticket estimates I got on this time were about $1,200. Um, most of our time is at home stay, except for um, the 
traditional housing costs for us, but we do have some side trips usually to call from um, cost of cost as well as carrying out our transport costs. So you said these tickets will be refundable. So I just don't want I want tickets that you don't get stuck. Correct. I managed to with the last attempted trip in 2020, we managed to get everything up. Unfortunately, in the intervening time, the airlines have made things a little stricter. It used to be that I did not have to go through until April and pay a dollar until we got to April and we were leaving for the summer. Um, now they can require this $100 deposit if you cancel tickets. Um, the, the tickets up to 90 days in advance. Um, if you go forward with the group, then um, $100 per ticket, um, which, although it's a lot, is pretty low on the other costs. And if the group is also small enough, I should be able to refrain from needing to deliver possible things very far in advance, which should uh, at least lower our exposure. Um, on that sort of thing. Normally, if you're a larger group of about you know, 20 people, I can't really wait until we're almost there to try and figure out possible things. But with a small group of eight, I can take our time to um, make sure that things are going to go before we try and work things out. So. How many do you usually take? Um, well, recently we tried to take about 18. We've had about 17 students on our study travel. Um, so I've been trying to gather around 16 to 15 exchange. Um, so hopefully we get to that day. Usually we have two full years of week right now um, to kind of prepare for it. And although I kind of gave people a heads up for it, um, the economic effect of COVID as well as just uncertainty of things, I think that's really well about you know, numbers to that. So I'm sure. so hopeful that at some point we'll get back on a two-year schedule and that will hopefully be the Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Allison? Yes, ma'am. Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, currently, we have no outstanding grievances. We still have the one uh, matter that's uh, queued up at Springfield for arbitration in April, but admittedly, both parties have expressed desire to come to uh, a conclusion on that, but because of the holiday, the haven't been. So I still feel that the key that was all. If you don't mind, I'll just move on to the IMC. Uh, we have one FOIA request this month. It was from the Associated Press. It was about the OCR complaint that was generated in February of 2017 that was adjudicated and agreed upon in January of 2018. Yeah. We complied with it. We sent them all the information in. Thank you. And finally, uh, comments by the Board of Education. Let's we'll start with uh, Member Bustam. Happy New Year, doesn't it? Hey. <laughs> Member Rodgers. I have no comments. 
prior to our Buildings and Ground Report. And I'm glad to say that in the hallways and classrooms, I see people are masked up for board policy. But I was recently out of town last week taking care of grandchildren. And my wife saved the newspapers for me. And as I kept looking at them, I kept looking, seeing activities held in our space with our staff and our students. And they're all athletic activities that I didn't see a single one of our participants masked up. And that concerns me that we have people using our facility during our, a school sanctioned activity. Our personnel and students not masked, and I don't think that's appropriate. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, I know last year we ended up having athletic events without spectators, and I don't want it to get to that point. I'm, I'm very concerned. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I, I agree that's something that we addressed earlier in the, the COVID pandemic. That we would adhere to the governor's mandate of, uh, of masking, and that applies to you know, everyone. You know, whether you're a teacher, student, a coach, or uh, other officials. <clears throat> but, uh, as everybody's well aware, the COVID numbers are higher than ever, and we want to be able to keep with these events, we want to continue to be able to have basketball games and other activities, and uh, it's imperative that we do everything we can to, uh, to prevent it. So, I hope, I hope people are listening. Um, any future agenda items? So there's in March, you said? March. Okay. Okay. Uh, next meeting date is Monday, February 14th, which is oh, wow. Valentine's Day. Which is Valentine's Day, because we all love to be here. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes.